Welcome to No Sex, Please. I'm religious. For 2,000 years and more, religion has had its own way with sex. The greatest battle it has ever faced is how to control the masses who love it. And so began the story of shame and disgust and dishonor. Forget he who must be named, but never forget it that must always be kept undercover. Welcome to an episode of No Sex, Please, I'm Religious, where a team of brilliant, quirky and sometimes irreverent believers explore and challenge the illicit relationship of religion and sex. Such poor bedfellows. David Aleph with No Sex, Please, I'm Religious, and I have my co-host, Kath Connolly, Dr. Kath Connolly, and I have a friend here who is a doctor, just like me, of nothing. And it's Tim Whitaker from the New Evangelicals. Tim, so grateful to have you with us this morning. Can I call you doctor or should I call you Tim? Tim is fine. I'm very is, humble. You're very humble, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good to be back. And Kath, thank you very much for being with us as well this morning. We've started really early. It's is six o'clock in the morning for us. And for wow. me, that is such a sacrifice. For Kath, it's not. She's already done a 20K pilgrimage somewhere, haven't you, Kath? Oh, yes, right around the block from here, from, the, <laughs> from, here to, from here to the coffee machine and back again. I got to be honest, David, if you asked me to do a podcast at 6 a.m. in the morning, I would decline because I have two small children. So if they're sleeping past 6 a.m., I'm taking every minute of that sleep while I can get it because I'm not a morning person either. So you're a braver man than I. <laughs> That's great. How, can I ask how old are your children? Yeah, we have a two and a half year old and a 10 month old. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> I'm with, I am with you there entirely. <laughs> Tim, I've been so impressed uh, since I came across the new evangelicals and I have did a, an interview recently with, with Troy and Brian from, I was a teenage fundamentalist and I was introduced to my Australian friends who are in Melbourne. We were introduced to them by you. So in oh. America, I didn't know they existed. Wow, so, that's yeah. great. So guys keep me busy. So that's great. Tim, tell us a bit, a little bit about yourself. I'm, I think you, you may have known from my emails. I'm agnostic these days. I was in a fundamentalist cult for years. I did also lead a, an evangelical mission for a number of years. Kath is my, I don't, my faith is on the shelf somewhere at the moment. And Kath is a spiritual director. She's quite a liberal Christian. In, which means, in my view, she's quite a loving person. Am I, do you want to say anything more about yourself, Kath? Look, I do call myself a Christian and I would put myself in the Anglican church, but oh. my work is very ecumenical. And I also work a lot with the whole the calling God feminine and very much working with goddesses and so on. So we're not, we're not talking a kind of 32 articles Anglican probably, but yeah. <laughs> Fair. worry about all that yeah. 30 30 what 28 articles maybe or uh, yeah, I, haven't I haven't read them this too early in the morning so tim and one thing we do have in common aside from being doctors of nothing is that uh, I, I wasn't educated in homeschooling but my older kids were we had a little homeschool set up with run by mothers and uh, i'm not a supporter of the homeschooling network now because of it, it doesn't in my view, give a broad enough uh, education. And it also doesn't give that social connection with uh, with people rubbing shoulders with people who aren't the same as you. So Tim, you came from that sort of background, fundamentalist background. Yeah. And yeah, and, I grew up that way. That's right. Yeah. I was homeschooled for nine years and everything. Wow. Yeah. And you've gone through quite a metamorphosis, if that's the word, from, I guess, fundamentalist Christianity in a form to yeah. to being an absolute heretic now. Oh, yeah, especially in, by American evangelical standards. And I know that I know that Australia and evangelicalism in Australia and in America, they share a lot of the same DNA these days. Yeah. Like I, I know Matt Chandler is really big in Australia and obviously you have Hillsong, et cetera. But yeah, that's in a nutshell kind of my journey from growing up in these more fundamentalist spaces, being homeschooled, very John MacArthur type of theology, very reformed, very Calvinist, the idea that God has predestined a few people really for heaven and the rest for damnation. Yeah. That's just how I grew up. And I was always committed. I was always a committed Christian as much as I knew how to be throughout my entire life, honestly, including now. Like I still see myself, I would argue, more devoted, hopefully, to the way of Jesus than what my tradition gave me. But 
Yeah, I mean, that that's a line from how I grew up as a child to where I am now. And there's a lot of twists and turns in that story. But the work I do now, most people in evangelical spaces, not all, I, I talk to quite a few people who are more moderate and run some large churches in, in, in America. Yeah. yeah who like our work, but maybe can't fully admit it, or maybe they're just curious, but we, you know, generally speaking, they don't like that. I use the word evangelical and they don't like that. We call ourselves new evangelical and they don't like that we're queer affirming or that we have a different view of the scriptures that, that isn't steeped in evangelical inerrancy. And for them, that's just one too many things to pull apart. So yeah, we're not really well loved in those spaces, but that's okay that they have their people, they have their community, and we're just trying to find better paths forward. I was in, I was listening to an interview with uh, Sandy. I don't know whether I'll pronounce her surname correctly. Kathy, you can correct me. Or do you, Tim? Sandy Toxic, who is a Danish British writer, comedian, and so on. She hosts a program or did host a program called QI, which is quite a fun program. Anyway, she is an atheist and she is about to have coffee with the Archbishop of Canterbury. And she's also a queer athe atheist. Her main point in putting the challenge out to the Archbishop of Canterbury, of course, was to talk about same-sex marriage yeah. and the church. And she wants to challenge him on, on issues of social justice and those sorts of thing, things. But one of the things in the interview that I listened to with her, which really saddened me enormously, was that she said she constantly gets death threats. And she said it's always from evangelicals. Yeah. I'm so, not surprised. The internet is... Here's what I'll tell you. In my experience... I have seen people from any walks of life say pretty horrific things. I'm like, wow, that's just really dehumanizing. Uh, it's shameful that evangelicals have no problem being in that mix. Mm -hmm. Times are the loudest voices and sometimes send the nastiest emails. I yeah. have a friend personally who I know who tweeted something and larger conservative pundits picked it up, retweeted it, and it got so bad they found what school she was a member of the board on, got her canned, and she ended up having to move cross country from mm. the West Coast in California all the way to the East Coast because of the threats that she was getting. So certainly, yeah, I've seen from her vantage point firsthand the kind of vitriol that people, especially many claiming the way of Jesus or claiming to be Christians, how they can behave, and it's really abhorrent. Yeah. What do you think's behind it? Is it fear? Is it individual fear that's become corporate? Is it that which is not examined has now become out there and nasty? What do you think's behind this? Okay. I think there are two core things. And one of them I wasn't even aware of until I did an interview with this person who really turned me on to this concept that I think it makes so much sense. I would say the first one is definitely fear, no doubt. People, whatever they can't fear, they tend to just react very viciously to. Yeah. But also there is a, and this might sound like a crass word, but this is the term that they use. There is a belief in, and a theology of disgust behind mm. it. And I just did a, a whole interview with this person. That's why it's fresh in my head talking about this idea of how as humans, we find some things disgusting, some things not disgusting and how that term disgust makes us repulsive, makes us want to, how could you do that? That's disgusting. That's gross. And I think a lot of evangelicals have that attitude of disgust towards people that they just can't understand, don't want to understand. The queer community is a prime example of this, or right now, I'm not sure how it is in Australia, but in America, the big thing is drag queens, right? Yeah. A lot of these pundits, the way they talk, it's not just fear, it's disgust. It's the sense of, it's repulsive, it's repulsion. I think that, that those two ingredients are what drives a lot of the hate that we see from people claiming to follow the way of Jesus, which if you read the Sermon on the Mount, looks very little like Ali Stuckey or Matt Walsh's ethic, and then their followers participate in that. So yeah. I think those are the two big things. We see we see the link also, Tim, because of our aim here is to try and raise funds and awareness <clears throat> for the queer folk in Africa and other countries. <laughs> Africa is not a country, David. Uh, other places around the world. Yeah. Uh, where the hatred is murder. People are killed by their family. And one of the interviews I did recently was with a friend that I've known for a few years who run, who is now in America safely, but he's been running a safe house in Nairobi. And we call them safe houses because they are safe, relatively safe. And the queer folk who can't live in the camps, the UNHCR camps, because they are too dangerous, go to Nairobi and then if they don't have a safe house to live in, they'll be beaten up on the streets, they'll be arrested, they'll be imprisoned for, with no charges and all, no serious charges or whatever. Um, 
And some of the stories are just horrendous. Like this guy I interviewed in, in, in his father, when he discovered that his son was gay, the boys were locked into their rooms at school because they're boarding schools type things. And then the father comes up and he says, I wish I'd brought my machete. And the boy is, I think he was 18 or 19 from memory. And he goes home and he's scared out of his wits, both of them thrown out of the school. And, and his mother says, I can't support you. You know that because I can't stand up against your father. And then he sees his father coming home, carrying a new machete wow. and he disappears, look, blah, blah, blah. But look, it's terrible. And so this, in my understanding of the gospels, my understanding of the message of Jesus and the character of Jesus is it's all about love, how I see it. Yeah. And when people come along and preach a message because it's the preachers who've caused this problem. It's gone into the culture basically over a couple of hundred years. Anyway, yeah. I can I can rattle on there, but this is why we find this is such an important and serious issue. Tim, let me ask you, I know on a recent podcast I was listening of yours, you talked about 2016 being a turning point for you. And of course, that was something to do with, I can't remember his name. Was it Voldemort? Something yeah. like that. Something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. <laughs> You're real close. <laughs> so how did that change you so in 2016 i was firmly seated in what i call conservative evangelical spaces i was a proficient drummer i was drumming every weekend at a church so i loved i loved being there i loved playing i still play music professionally to this day i still play like in a band on the weekends and stuff so it's music is a very big passion of mine and i have always loved the church i've always been involved in evangelical spaces since i was a kid you name it i've done it i've helped church plant new places i've done the worship thing i've done the mission trip thing i've done the parachurch ministry thing i'm one of those i just have all the accolades accolades and so I say all that to set the stage of when 2016 happened, I wasn't quote unquote liberal. I wasn't even affirming. I was certainly in the camp of, hey, we should love these folks and they should have equal rights under the law. But as far as the church went, my position was the Bible's clear, but we can still make room. The Bible's still clear. So I was not like some progressive or liberal person really in a lot of ways. And when Trump happened, and again, like I grew up on talk radio, I grew up on Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh. These are people that I was in, in, inundated with my whole life. And when Trump happened, one of the moments that really made me go, wait a second, what? it, it was so topsy-turvy, like my world just was totally turned upside down, was realizing that as a child, the people who raised me in church taught me about a very specific sexual ethic, right? Pornography is bad. Masturbation is bad. You don't have sex until you're married with one person for the rest of your life. These are family values. The world does things differently. We're not of the world. This is how a Christian should live. Okay. And then Trump comes along and the same people who taught me are the same people mad at me because I won't vote for the guy on the cover of Playboy, the guy on his third marriage, the guy who slept with the porn star and paid it off while his wife was yeah. pregnant, the guy who made comments about his daughter, how he date his daughter if yeah. it wasn't his daughter. And I'm like, hey, again, like, I'm not a liberal here, okay, but we can all agree this is bad. And they're like, what do you mean? Yeah, maybe, but we need a commander in chief, not a pastor in chief. Now, I was born in 88, so I'm 34, and I remembered just enough about what happened when Bill Clinton had the affair in the White House. I remember how the evangelical response was how morality is so key. I remember how Franklin Graham, maybe even Billy Graham, said something to the effect of, if we can't trust a man with his family, we can't trust him with the nation, right? And all of a sudden, I'm like, guys, you have a much worse candidate than that right yeah. in front of you, who yeah. also admitted to grabbing women, assaulting them. And you're telling me that I'm the crazy one because I won't vote for this dude? Now, at the time, Hillary Clinton was not an option for me. I didn't like Hillary for a lot of reasons. So I voted third party, which in America is a big deal. Like you vote third party, you're throwing your vote away is like the same. So that was the beginning of, whoa, okay, I'm part of this world. I believe the same things. Why are our values, right? Because I just assumed same beliefs equal same values. That was one of the moments where I go, no, like we're on, we're in topsy-turvy land here. And it only got worse as time went on. As the Trump worship 
by evangelicalism got worse, I got more and more like disenchanted with this political side. I can't believe this. Mm -hmm. And then when you move to the Black Lives Matter movement and seeing how, again, the church largely responded to that, how friends of mine who were pastors in my local area were sharing Candace Owens talking points yeah. about George Floyd. Candace Owens is a very far right political commentator for those of your audience who might not know. And I'm like, whoa, what is up here? And then you add the COVID response. And I'm watching pastors make this a war that masking is tyranny. What are we talking? Again, I'm yeah. still at my evangelical church. I am serving every week faithfully. I'm loving it. I'm fully invested. I'm a volunteer. I'm one of those. I'm not even getting paid. I'm all in. But I'm like, this. I don't get it. Wearing a mask makes complete sense. We don't know yeah. how this virus spreads yet. We don't know all the details. Why would we not wear a mask? Why would we not social distance? So all those three things really blew the lid open for me of this realization. And I didn't have words for it then like I do now, but it was a realization that we, just because we share the same beliefs does not mean we share the same values. And we didn't like our values were totally different. Yeah. So that stuff really accelerated what some people might call deconstruction. I'm not sure if I would call what I went through exactly that, but certainly a renegotiation of my faith certainly renegotiating what it means to be a Christian. I tell people I had a crisis of theology, not a crisis of faith in that moment. And so that's the trajectory that I was put on. Wow, it's, a, it's quite a journey. And what does it bring up for you, Kath? I can only imagine the disconnect that you were going through as you were trying to reconstruct something that made sense, a faith and a love of the Jesus story and your whole social up around you was saying, nah, we do it so differently. We're basically preaching a theology of hate. Yeah, that's what I think sometimes in this world or explosion of deconstruction, a lot of people who don't understand it or don't want to understand it don't realize that many people, not all, many people leave the tradition. I, I get it. I respect it. It's totally legit. But for a lot of people, including myself, I like framing it, wait, I'm trying to be more faithful. You're the ones who taught me to take this stuff seriously. So I am, and it's not lining up at all with how you're living or what you're saying. But because you radicalized me, I got to keep going further into this. That's how I saw what I was doing. It wasn't leaving the faith. It was getting out of the basement and getting into the, in, into the house of the Christian tradition and realizing how much bigger and more beautiful it was than ever. That, that expression about the basement is obviously, I've heard something you use quite a lot don't you, about getting out of the basement and so on. So then take us over to the start of the new evangelicals, because to me, discovering you is completely a revelation to me, discovering the new evangelicals and your podcast and so on. You've had what, over 500,000 downloads or something? Is that right? Yeah, we, yeah, we do about 12,000 downloads a week right now. Wow. That is, that's extraordinary. So when you first started, what did you think was going to happen? So the way I, so the way I started New Evangelicals was actually during COVID and yeah. I was watching Sean Foyt. I'm not sure how much your audience knows about him, but no, he's essentially no, no. a worship dude. And he was doing these protests in America under the pretense of worship. So he was okay. holding, now this is when COVID first started. So yeah. we're still wiping down our surfaces. We don't know how this stuff spreads yet. And we're all locked down, which I think makes a lot of sense. And this, I saw, I see this guy, he has long curly blonde hair and he's like doing these protest worship events with no masks, with massive yeah. amount of people yeah. saying, we won't be masked, faith over fear, tyranny. This is tyranny. And I'm just like, again, I'm a worship guy, right? This is my world. Yeah. This is what I spent decades doing. So I'm like, this is really wacky. This is really wacky. And as I'm watching him more and more, I'm like, this is really problematic. And I'm sitting on my rocking chair on my front porch one day, like an old man, no offense, David, I'm just <laughs> for me, I felt like an older man and I'm just stewing over this, right? I'm like, I'm just, I'm frustrated between everything, yeah. Trump, COVID, Black Lives Matter, I'm in my whole other history. I'm just, I'm fuming. And yeah. I, go, I don't know, a new evangelical movement. Like we need new evangelicals. Like Tim, you have a lot of, am I, am I allowed to curse on your podcast? Is yeah, you can, of course you can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I said, Tim, you have a lot of shitty ideas often, but this one's not bad. That's not a bad name. So I checked it online. No one had it. It wasn't anywhere. I'm like, you know what? Yeah. Let me just grab it for a rainy day. Yeah. I have no, again, I'm still serving at my church. I'm still yep. in church. Okay. And in December of 2021, I started this little Instagram account just Pretty much saying, hey, anyone else like thinking about this stuff? Anyone else concerned? 
And that's how this whole thing started. And it, it blew up for what it was pretty quickly. And I realized very quickly, I'm like, oh my gosh, I hit a nerve. And then that's how I found the term deconstruction. That's how I found the term exvangelical. I didn't yep. know those terms before this account. And that launched me into a world and a way of seeing the world that forever changed me. And what happened was within about six months of starting just the Instagram account, we weren't even a nonprofit yet. I started podcasting in March, so several months later, but in April of that year, my senior pastor sat me down over lunch and pretty much gave me the ultimatum of, hey, either you stop serving as a volunteer at our church with music, or you stop doing your work online. It was pretty much the ultimatum. So I said, I, at that point, I was getting so many messages from people saying, this is really helping. This is saving my faith. I didn't know this stuff was possible. And I'm still new. I'm still green. Yeah, me too. I'm in it with you kind of thing. And I just <laughs> knew that work was so much more important than me getting satisfaction from drumming every Sunday. And even though it was really painful to leave, I lost my entire community within really a week, besides four or five people who we still yeah. talk to. I, I made, it was an easy call. I said, okay, I shook his hand on Thursday yeah. and pretty much never stepped foot back in that church since. Yeah. So that's how we got started. Well, Tim Whitaker of the New Evangelicals. What I'm really interested in is it's so easy for us and we do it podcast after podcast is tear these denominations apart. These ones that are being really critical, the ones we're talking about here, the ones that, want, that aren't speaking the gospel values that we might like to speak. How do we then reconstruct? How do we build a place of faith and hope? How, what's, your, what's your work in here that we're actually <laughs> not just pulling people down? Because in, in, in that way, why are we any different from those who yes. are also preaching a gospel of hate? Because where do we, you know what I'm saying here? It's, it's easy to move into our own hate language here. Yes. I'm not into we, that. What are you seeing as a way to say, here's a way of, of bringing gospel values to this? Okay. I'll try not to be super long winded, but there's a lot to unpack here, right? Because the, in, in essence, it's tension. A lot of tension is how we do it as an organization, as a community, because on one hand, we, our community is made up of people who have been incredibly harmed by the evangelical church. I'm talking legitimate sexual mm. abuse from pastors. I'm talking yeah. people who are queer, who just have stories that just make you weep, right? You're like, holy shit. I mm. cannot believe this pastor said this to you yeah. on top of that. And I'm sure you, this is no different in your spaces in Australia, but especially in America, we see evangelical leader after evangelical leader being caught doing not just, oh, someone, he lost his temper one time and he's sorry, and we're going to cancel him. We're not talking about that. We're talking about patterns of abusive behavior that go completely unchecked with no repentance. And they're still platformed by the evangelical culture that claims to be standing on the true gospel. I'm thinking about like Mark Driscoll, for example, someone who has an entire podcast series devoted to how harmful he is, still preaches and leads a church. And more importantly, is networked in the evangelical machine. Or you have someone like John MacArthur, who three stories last year broke of John MacArthur hiring three different men who ended up being pedophiles on his staff. No accountability, no repentance, not even an acknowledgement from John, right? Yeah. Still seen as one of these gospel heroes. So the rage, the anger, the hurt is completely valid from where I sit. It is valid. And sometimes to speak the biblical language, the word, the anger of the prophet is needed, right? Sometimes you got to turn some tables over, right? Yeah. Especially when it's so harmful. Cool. So I see that and I go, yeah, no, I'm totally on board. This is a problem. And we have to create a space where people can find us and vent and not be judged for how angry they are. Okay. That's one side, right? On the other side, or the tension of that is two things. Number one, you can easily become a fundamentalist all over again. So Absolutely. you can go from one fundamentalism to the other of these new absolutes, this new objective truth that is just your way or the highway. That's not healthy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, as an organization and as even a community, like our Facebook community, we have a very strong position of no dehumanization. Even the people that we don't like. Okay. There are people who have come into our group and said something like, fuck Mark Driscoll. And we go, you can't say that here. You can say you find Mark Driscoll really problematic. You think Mark Driscoll should be deplatformed. But once we start engaging in the dehumanization tactics that Mark Driscoll or someone else engages in, now we're on their same path. Now we're on the same exact path that they're on. And in my view, the way that we beat people like that at their own game is by taking their game, throwing it in the trash and setting it on fire. There's no reason to be a bigger bully. It only 
gets us stuck in this cycle of chaos that we're trying to break from. So that's how we do our best, never perfect. And we're dealing with like in, in our Facebook group, over 6,000 people who are all in different stages of this, right? So it's never always perfect, but we do our best to hold the space of, yeah, let it out, dude. Yeah, say it. And yeah. guess what? We're going to agree with you and say, yeah, that was fucked up. There you go. We said it. We said the F word for you. Yep. We're yep. angry with you. Now, when you're ready and it's on your time, if you're ready, and if you want to stay in this house, we can help you explore other ways of going forward that maybe channel this anger into some productive ways. Because I personally believe that anger leads to bitterness, and then we're in a lot of trouble. We're in yeah. a lot of trouble. So that's a big picture. We can unpack whatever you want there, but that's how we navigate this world. There's, there is so much, sorry, Kath, there is so much to, to unpack in all of that, isn't there? And I, look, I agree. I've seen uh, from my background and so on, I've seen people coming out of fundamentalism and then, and I could talk about Israel, for example, the persecution of the Jews through the Holocaust, which was horrendous, absolutely horrendous and disgraceful that so much of the world took a blind eye to that. But then we don't always see the best of behavior from Israel. And that is a response that you would think that the response would be completely different to what was done to them. But then it's so I'm, uh, that's well, that, a, that, those are cycles that those are cycles that we see, I think, in the human condition and yeah. we see in scripture, right? There is this theme of, okay, Israel gets liberated, then they become the oppressor. And yeah, God's yeah. like, okay, what do we do with that? Yeah. And that I think even broader, that's just what humans can do, right? Yes. And so I hear you on that. It is very easy to go from being marginalized to wanting that power to then marginalize the people who oppressed you. And I'll be honest with you guys, as someone who's a white cisgendered male, it's not always my job to tell people in those positions, like how to, no. like, it's never going to be my job to tell the queer community how to handle what happened to them at the expense of evangelicalism. Yes. But at the same time, what I can say is, Hey, as far as this community goes, here are the values we're aiming for your voices. We want to center. We want to learn from you. We want to understand how we move forward. But as an organization, we have these values. And if you're cool with that, we can work together and try and find ways forward. And if not, I totally get it. And maybe this group is better for you. Yeah. So we try and make sure that we're not becoming almost like this white savior complex. Like, oh, this new white guy has yeah. new answers that yeah. everyone should just assimilate to. It's yeah. not that simple, frankly. No. Yeah. So I agree. <laughs> no, it's a fine line to be walked, isn't it? We've got yeah. a podcast that I was hoping to have published earlier this week, but I'm still waiting for people to check it out to make sure that it's, we're not going to get sued. Fair. But this is, this is a horrendous story. And it was many years ago at leading Catholic college at Sydney university. And you, you'll have mirror stories of this in the States, of course. And now that college, I looked it up and I think there's a series of five or six archbishops and three cardinals that all came out of that college. <laughs> so that the Catholic college at the university bred these wonderful, powerful people. And of course, power always corrupts, you know, yeah. absolute power always corrupts. Yeah. So the, the story very briefly, it's called Silentium. And this guy built a mitre, which is the hat, the beautiful hat that the cardinals and the archbishops wear, right? It's amazing how some of these guys are so anti-queer and yet they love their finery and their silks and their <laughs> beautiful grounds, don't they? Anyway, let's not go there. Anyway, this two, two young guys were taken out and beaten and sodomized with implements and all kinds of things. They were driven on a road about three, three hours in the boot of a car and they were dumped in a ditch in a national park. And anyway, both of their lives were pretty much ruined from that one event. And then the students in the college jeered them, even though they were the victims. This is what, these are the claims that the guy has made. And he spent two years making his mitre to tell the story because the, all the emblems on there talk about this abuse. So he made a mitre for the Archbishop of Sydney, which was the Archbishop at the time back in 1985. Now there's two leading and I'm saying leading politicians in Australia who were a part of the, uh, the peers at the time. So no one's saying they did anything wrong, but they didn't do anything right either because <laughs> mm. the students didn't speak up for them. And the archbishop actually got the police to crush the story, destroy the file. Wow. This is the claim that the guys made. And wow. again, you'll, you've got mirrors of that in America, in the States. So there is an example of not only 
power completely wrong, right? Because there's yes. no justice in any of that. But you've also got it being done in the name of church, which is in the name of God. What sort of God yes. does this sort of stuff? Totally. Uh, so we've got a massive job ahead of us. So what our podcast is about, different to yours, of course, is we're looking at how religion has distorted the message about sex, all right, and made it a shameful thing. And so people can't talk about it freely, can't yeah. discuss it and so on. Let me ask you a specific question. You don't have to answer this one, Tim, but how did you first learn about sex? Did you get a nice talk about it from mum and dad or school or your home school or what? Yes. So my first recollection of being told about a version of sex is okay. there was a TV show. Did you say a ver Pro sorry, sorry, did you say a virgin of sex? No, a version. One oh sorry. No, that was a joke. I'm being no I'm being naughty, don't worry. <laughs> it's six o'clock in the morning by you, David. I wasn't ready for you to be so sharp. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> there was a show back in the day on on a station here called Promise Land. And one of the episodes involved a guy and a girl making out and the girl wanted to have sex with them and he said no. And I was like, Hey, what is dad? What is this? What are they doing? Kind of thing. And she handed him a condom and I didn't know what it was. So my dad brought me upstairs and gave me the talk. And honestly, I don't remember, I don't remember much about it besides being really grossed out. I think I was like, I had nine or 10. I'm like, Oh <laughs> wait, that goes, that goes in there. Oh no. Then of course I'm like, wait, you guys, oh my God, no, that's horrible. And then <laughs> later on, maybe a couple months later, my dad gave me some more details about how the actual sexual process between two consenting adults works. And that was pretty much it. That was pretty yeah. much the extent of my talk. And then when you're a kid in church, you learn about some things here or there, like through friends, maybe you're playing basketball and someone says, there's this thing called whatever it is, and here's how it works. And you're like, okay, and you're 12 years old, but whatever. And when you're out the other, that was my first major exposure to yeah. what sex is. Yeah. Okay. When, so it, that was the only time it's talked about. So again, what, one of the sayings that I use these days is if it's not discussed, and you talked about disgusting before, but if it's not discussed, it's disgusting. Apparently, in our first podcast, I interviewed Dr. Tina Shermer Sellers, who was a sexologist and had written a couple of wonderful books. And one of her books, her first book was the one that inspired our interview with her. And she talked about counseling couples who had suffered because of the purity mode, yeah. no, no dating, no kissing, no petting nothing to go out etc suddenly on your wedding night everything's supposed to be right oh yeah but listen i tell all people knows this public on my first kiss i was 17 and i threw up afterwards i was so nervous oh god wow. i swear to god i kissed her looked at her and said i think i'm gonna throw up and oh, ran no. out of the car and threw up <laughs> and then i came back in i looked at her again and said i think i'm gonna throw up again i threw up twice my <laughs> stomach was so worked up from like this kiss oh, i was dear. so just worked up about being just right is it wrong am i allowed to do this like all those feelings and i vomited i blew chunks yeah oh dear Can, <laughs> it, now was that did that girl become your wife was that someone else no, we ended up dating for like a year and a half. It was a pretty, it was a pretty toxic relationship because looking back on it, there was a lot of this purity culture, right? So it's, yeah. and also the sense of, is that, are you going to marry her? Like if you are, like you get a promise ring for this person. Yeah. So yeah. it was a lot of combinations in one. We were both passionate people. It's our first girlfriend. It was my first sexual experience with, with someone that's obviously very bonding when you're 17, don't know how things work and you're figuring out together. So it, it didn't end well. We continued like hooking up afterwards for a couple of years on and off. Yeah. It was just yeah. very toxic. It, it wasn't healthy. So well, much pressure, isn't there? That first kiss could mean this is the person I have to marry because of purity culture, like the pressure on that. Yeah, that, and there was just a lot of guilt. I didn't have categories for anxiety when I was younger, but that's what it was. And there would be times like if, after we broke up, or even before, if we hooked up or my wife and I technically were virgins, so we got married, but it was like by the skin of our teeth. So my <laughs> girlfriend and I did something else. When we were all done, I would just feel so guilty pit in my stomach i, I it would be to the point where i wouldn't even go home i used to play in a band and they had a barn where all our band gear was i would just go there and sleep for the night in the cold i was just so guilty and worked up over i did it again i can't control myself i keep messing up and that idea is just it was deeply ingrained in me and i ended up actually that i that concept made me seem almost like 
I don't want to use the term bipolar because I'm not, and I don't want to speak light of that, but I felt like two different people. There yeah. was just one part of me that was like, would do anything to hook up with my ex-girlfriend. Then there was another part that'd be like, how could you do something so stupid? What's wrong with you? Like no control. So I felt very torn all the time. May I give you something to think about there, Tim? Sure. I, I, my day job is working with people with disabilities and I have not published this stuff, but I've been writing about this, the stuff we're talking about now for years. And I, thought about somebody who was, and I wrote about this, and I'm going to publish it soon, somebody who was on the autism spectrum, okay, being raised, let's say, in an Irish Catholic, by an Irish Catholic grandma, okay, and all the emphasis is on purity and be, and take, taking note of your sins to be able to take to the priest. Now, knowing how the brain works for people who are strongly on the, on the spectrum, my story has this boy walking around with a notepad. And every time he has a thought like you just had, he writes it down. And so he walks down the street and he takes two, two paces and stops to write, takes another three paces and stops to write. And he's so obsessed by it that he, he's not free. And that's, that's an extreme example, but it's how would somebody who is on severely on the spectrum, how would they cope with those purity messages? And you've obviously suffered through it and many other people have, but you don't have those issues to cope with. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Yeah. The, yeah. It's such a dangerous thing. I tell you what, I'm going to just break for one second. We've probably got about 15 minutes left. Great. I'm going to, I'm going to take you, if you don't mind, you and Kath, I'm going to share with you. I don't normally do free ads, but I want to, I want to show the minute or so of the promo of the family, because it is just so powerful. I'm sorry. It's going to take me a second. Oh, to so find this it. Day television series yes yeah have you seen it kath i have yes but just to give it a context for our listeners yeah thank you thank you sorry i'll have to find it again oh take um, your time do you do much do much editing afterwards when you do an interview i'll edit this out obviously. Uh, not a whole lot it just depends if there's like bad pops or if i cough or something we'll edit it out but as far as like the actual structure we rarely ever edit like an episode unless someone's hey i don't want that aired can you edit this part out then we'll edit it out yeah. Okay. Okay. That's, that's pretty amazing. I spend a bit of time editing. I've now used a thing called Descript. Do you know that? Oh, I've heard of that before. Yeah. I've heard good oh, things. God, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. All right. Let's just watch this together and then have a little bit of a talk about it. Cause I think it's really important. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay. Sound should be on. Here we go. In my twenties, I stumbled my way in. And what I found is a secretive Christian organization called The Family that had been hiding in plain sight for over 80 years. This was a group with tentacles around the world. A humble example of leadership that the world has never seen. A breathtaking enmeshment of church and state. There were congressmen, senators, world leaders. And they say it's about faith, but there's a shared understanding that what we're really about here is power. I'd like to single out Doug Coe and all of his associates. I'm grateful. Doug Coe is the longtime leader of the family. He's the most powerful man in Washington you've never heard of. He said the more invisible you can make your organization, the more influence it will have. Jesus plus nothing. It's a powerful thing. Using the National Prayer Breakfast, they dispatch representatives to build relationships with foreign leaders. That is exactly the kind of meeting that I would want to exploit. For the family, Jesus says you must go to those who are in positions of power. God always uses imperfect vessels to do his perfect work. President Trump's an imperfect vessel. Jesus is the answer, but Jesus and Capitol Hill don't mix. Because we want our family to stay together. <laughs> you, you, we needed you with your drums. I, just, I always just want to weep when I see this sort of thing. It's just so anathema to what I understand Jesus of Nazareth was on about. Yeah. I mean, listen, I could rant about this in Christian nationalism for a long time. So I'll let you guys lead the discussion here. But yes, I'm with you on this completely. It's, it is, it is, now that I'm on this side of things, it's wow, I can't believe I got out the way that I did without getting sucked up into this, because if you're, when you're in it, you just don't see anything beyond it. Yeah. When I was, um, when I first came across this, which is a couple of years ago, and I shared it widely because I was pretty, <laughs> pretty amazed by it. 
Back in my evangelical years working with international needs, I went, I think I went to only one prayer breakfast because that movement is right around the world, as you'd know. And I went to the Melbourne prayer breakfast and there's a Sydney prayer breakfast and so on. And I, of course, had no idea that this, that there was such a power network behind it and such a cynical direction that was behind it. And of course, I think if... We have issues with your president, Voldemort. This was preparing the way for him in some oh, ways, yeah. for oh, someone I like mean, him. For sure. There's really a lot of a lot of ingredients that, that, that give rise to Trump. And this family, this idea of the family is one of them. You also have the New Apostolic Reformation, which is this very like charismatic prophet apostle based network of faith leaders who really got on board with Trump early. Paula White is, she's not in the NAR, so to speak, but she's definitely adjacent to it. And Paula White is someone who is Trump's like really faith advisory. She even had her own office in the White House at one point. So there's a lot of ingredients there. And then of course, there's also just the history of white supremacy in America yeah. that unfortunately evangelicals have been a really effective conduit of being throughout the history of our country. And so there's a lot of those elements together that really Trump was the fruit of what was decades in the making. He wasn't an anomaly. He wasn't like, how could this happen? I mean, of course, at the time, I didn't know how it could happen. I didn't understand what I was swimming in, but <clears throat> excuse me. But now that I know what I know, it's, oh yeah, this was inevitable before someone like Trump was pretty much raised to power in the GOP and then elected president. Yeah. In Australia, we've just, uh, in the last election, we've got rid of not quite a Trump, but somebody similar. In, yeah. in, in, he was a charismatic Pentecostal Christian, good friend. Yes. Of, Brian Houston's and so on, you know all about that. And some of the things that he did as prime minister was was completely without without accountability. He during COVID he appointed himself secretly to five ministries. He became the wow. yeah, I know you it must be laugh. nice. Just, I know. It's like I know. Michael Scott in the office just declaring things. I just declare bankruptcy. I declare I'm in charge of this. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And he became co-treasurer, and the treasurer didn't know he was treasurer. He became, I can't remember them all, but there were five of them. And this is, and he didn't even tell his colleagues. And of course, wow. and I, sus, I suspect it's because I'm God's man. I can do anything. God complex is real. Absolutely. Yeah. It's scary. T tell us, Tim, where you see new, the new evangelicals going. What if you could wa wave a magic wand, what would you like to see? The I want to see Marxism all over America. That's my whole goal is just to I usher thought in so. socialist, I democratic, so. sat satanic Marxism everywhere and yeah. destroy America. Yeah. That's the whole goal of what we're trying to do. Hang, um, hang on. Can I just look? I'm sure I, you've got those, you've got them already. The horns. They're there. Oh, I know they're growing. <laughs> I know. I keep telling my wife, but she doesn't believe me. There's a, there's, we do a lot of different things, right? So we do yeah. podcasts. We do content, we do a lot of storytelling. So I think the general direction is hopefully helping people who are stuck in this basement yeah. know that they don't have to be in the basement and they can still be faithful to Jesus. Yeah. And hey, if that's you, we can hold space for that and you can have a place to tell your story and have a place to be heard and hopefully listen to and then help navigate the church in better ways forward. I'm not so convinced at this point in my life that the evangelical institution and industrial complex is a worth saving or be salvageable. I just yeah. don't think it is at this point for so many reasons. Yeah. So it's not really about trying to reform this institutional mega church thing. It's about really trying to be part of moving away from that and defining better paths forward that are still rooted in the Christian tradition. Luckily for us, we're only sitting on, oh, I don't know, 2,000 years of church history of all different kinds of expressions and theologians and scholars and prophets and, and activists that we can learn from. And most of them have not existed in the basement, thankfully. So I think there's just that kind of sense of like, how do we explore these other rooms and just help people maybe get to rooms that, that they, that they want to be in? Maybe yeah. someone's, hey, I love this room of Eastern Orthodoxy. I just want to park here. It's just beautiful. Great. We did our job then, right? Okay. Uh, accomplished. You found a room that you like. So I think that's a big part of it. And I hope the other part of us is just trying to let people know that, that we're here and that you don't have to stay stuck for sure. And yeah. hopefully the evangelical church knows that we're going to hold their feet to the flames, so to speak. We're not going to let them get away with just abusing people and pretending, oh, it's no big deal. It's grace. It didn't really happen this way. We're always going to do our best to advocate for the folks marginalized by the evangelical church and center those voices instead of centering the leaders and these, I call them gatekeepers and how they like to spin things that, that, that tend to benefit them always and never yeah. really the actual victims.
Yeah. It's such a tight rope you must be walking there because the, the, the there must be some pressure to become your own church with all the problems involved in that. It's such a tight rope. Yeah, some people have asked us about that. And frankly, I say absolutely not. Yeah. I have no desire to become a church. First off, non a nonprofit organization becoming church, I think just repeats the cycle that we're trying to get away from. On a personal level, just me personally, I don't believe in paid clergy. I don't believe in, in, in a CEO model of a, of a leader. I believe in a plurality of leaders, a group like coming together in small groups around their neighborhoods. So even my ideal model for church right now wouldn't even fit into what we're doing as an organization. At the same time, I do think that I don't know when I'm always dreaming, but I could see ourselves in a few years from now. Maybe just having churches that we can recommend people that are like, put it crassly, new evangelical certified or like part of like this network yeah. that we're just, yeah. because people do want to go. I get all the time, where can I find a church that's affirming or that is social justice minded or that it takes scripture seriously? I would love to recommend them. We just don't have any right now, but that could be cool to do it in the future, but never us as an organization. I would never want to become pastor or not my thing. Partly then you lose your power of the voice you've got now of being outside the church. Yeah, listen, I didn't want to be outside the church. I think if I'm ta if I'm being honest, there's a good chance that if my church made room for me, I'd probably still be there because I just loved yeah. it so much. Yeah. It's hard to say, but I would probably still be there. So I didn't want to be outside the evangelical institutions. Clearly the church is just a gathering of people, so the church is anywhere. But yeah, I can't see myself going back there or becoming this better version of what I think it should be because honestly, that's pretty evangelical. Church plants happen all the time, right? Because, yeah. oh, we're doing church better. That's yep. just such a narcissistic and yep. egotistical way of approaching church that I think is ahistorical and un unhealthy, truly. I suspect that the problem, and I have for years, the problem with what we're talking about here is simply narcissism. And it is that when you have a narcissistic personality type of a church, naturally he or she, mainly he, will want to be CEO, right? We'll want to have the big office. We'll want to have the big car, all of those sort of things. And what you are demonstrating is that you're not that because otherwise you'd be saying, yeah, I reckon that'd be good. And maybe a Learjet would be good so I can get around a bit. Yeah. I think what I would say is I don't want to become, that. listen, I think if I'm being honest, are there days where I've been like, man, having a really nice car would be sweet or yeah, having yeah, that, yeah. that, that lifestyle of a clean person, just traveling, speaking, people just hang on every word you say that's attractive. I think yeah. for a lot of people, and I'm not exempt from that, from finding that attractive in a lot of ways. Of course not. And I think that there's always that temptation of just, man, uh, it'd be just great to just have a lot of money and not worry about my healthcare. Cause in America, we worry about healthcare. It's that would just be so nice. And listen, I'm the new evangelicals pays me fine. I'm able to survive with my family. But there are days where I'm like, man, our house can use some upgrades. Oh, a bigger house would be nice. And there's always that fruit, right? Yeah. There's always yeah. the apple where you're like, man, do I trust partnering with God's wisdom to make wise decisions? Or do I just want to bypass that and take the fruit from my own taking and just say my way is better. And so there's always, I think, in the back of my head, that awareness that all of us have to have, especially being on people of this side of the microphone, right? Yeah. Of just awareness of we're all... We're not, we have the same temptations. We're still very fucking human, frankly. Years ago, I had a friend who was an Anglican, which, which for your um, American listeners is Ep Episcopalian. He was a Anglican minister in Sydney and he had a radio program. His original career was in broadcasting and he was quite, if I used to get him to come to our group to, to preach because he'd preach on the, he'd give a good balance to the scriptures and so on. Anyway, he always had, he was so nervous of a microphone. And I talked to him about that one day and I said, why are you? Because he, he talked softly and he said, look, I've been in broadcasting. I know how easy it is to really to be almost worshipped in that position because people you're so powerful and so on i just want to avoid it <laughs> and so i think he was probably a little bit over the top with that but i can understand the sin sin sincerity of him well listen i don't think i don't even i'll put it in 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 this light i don't think brian houston planned on becoming who brian houston is now 25 years ago i think brian houston really had as pure as he know as he knew pure motives to start whatever he did. Mark Driscoll is the same thing. I've heard clips of Mark. Yeah. So I just, I think learning from their example, once you think you're above it, you're probably not actually no. above it.
you know? Yeah. And so you have to be aware that like, you're just human and having accountability structures in place. In our case, we have a board, et cetera. And we are also completely transparent with our finances. You can literally go to the newevangelicals.com right now and see our profit and loss statement from last quarter. You wow. can see how much I make, where the money went, it's just there. That's how I think you hopefully avoid some of those pitfalls of becoming bigger than you think that you are and becoming yeah. entitled that people owe you something. Yeah. You've also got the, uh, the marker that keeps us honest, but which is the Jesus story. As soon as we keep coming back and saying, hang on, we're talking about a message of love and peace and what have you. That's going to keep being the, the mark of which keeps us honest. I was talking to someone yesterday and said this, and I just jotted it down. I loved it. She said, we are human with eternity written on our heart. That's so nice. We are human yeah. with eternity written on our heart. So yes, yeah. we're talking about this whole human thing, but yeah. Yeah. and we are made in the image of God. And that's going to keep us, I think, accountable for right values. Yeah. The, the yeah. trouble there though is, it, and I think that should be the case, but the, the trouble is when you look at, for example, the story I gave before, which Kathy, you know, very well, the story of Silentium, there are the people who claim to be worshipers of the same Jesus. And yet they can so easily forget that love message and do all kinds of other things. Look, just to finish, Tim, we've, I'm very grateful for your time today. And you're a humble man because you're, you've got this great podcast and huge numbers of people listening. And uh, we're only newbies. So thank you very much for giving <laughs> us your time. Buddy. Oh, and listen, I'll be honest with you, David. Let me be transparent. Anytime someone asks me to come on their show so I can talk, I take it because as a podcast host, you're always asking the questions. Yeah. Someone's like, yeah, come on and you get to talk. I'm like, I'm there. Anytime you want me to come on and rant, I will come on the show and rant. I'll I'll <laughs> I'm sure Kath will have uh, Tim back at some stage, won't we? Because we've only just touched the surface. Look, the yeah. one thing I wanted to finish on sure. is talk about, you, you call yourselves the new evangelicals. And we talk about all this, these issues with the evangelicals. But when you look to the evangelical movement, when it started, it's totally different in my understanding to what has evolved and w what we just saw in that the family trailer. You're the first person I've ever talked to on a podcast that recognizes that, Not frankly, really. because yeah. people always ask, why new evangelicals? And I have to tell them, like, listen, I get why the word evangelical is so terrible. I now I do. Yeah. Yeah. But the early tradition, particularly through through the Wesleyan movement, incredibly thinking. social minded. They yeah. were, in America, they were abolitionists. They were the first yeah. people to ordain women. Incredibly forward thinking. So I think that by calling ourselves the new evangelicals, it's an attempt to swing the bat to hopefully tell a fundamentalist you can't have the name; it doesn't belong to you. And b maybe we can have some good news to tell people again because right now there is no good news. The yeah. news is horrible. So yeah. I think that's why I keep the name. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look, that's fantastic. Yeah. Tim, thank you very much for your time. We're really, really grateful to you and we wish you all the very best. I'm going to keep listening to your podcasts. The trouble is there's not enough hours in the day. I and know. Some of us need to sleep at night. Wake up at six o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just do what Kath does. 5 a.m., yeah. six o'clock in the morning, run your, you run your five or 10 K. Yeah, you get your coffee and you listen to my podcast and you're right as rain, going. guaranteed to fix all your problems. Guaranteed. <laughs> we'll find <laughs> out one day. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks. So Thanks for having me. I appreciate Thank it. You Thank care you. of the new evangelicals. Thank you so much. It's been Thank great. Thank you. Please don't forget to support the podcast through Patreon, other sources, or direct to our website. This podcast supports refugees who are suffering terribly in Africa because of religious hate. It's time to show them some love.